In order to increase the opportunities that women have to work and to improve the quality of the work that is available to women, you should know about women's rights in relation to work. As you know, wages and conditions of work are determined by employers after negotiating with workers. From the perspective of workers, labor law is a device that corrects the imbalance in power of the negotiating positions between employers and employees. The state intervenes in the labor market through labor law to prevent wages and conditions of work from being pushed below levels that are considered acceptable. Labor law contains rules that protect the ability of workers to organize and bargain collectively and set out minimum standards for the various aspects of work such as wages, working time, health and safety, workplace facilities and social security. From the perspective of employers, labor law limits the methods that workers can use to bargain collectively. For example, it restricts the ability of workers to strike work. Hello and welcome to the second module of this course on decent work for women. We will begin this module with an introduction to labor law. We have seen broadly the various objectives that the state pursues in its intervention in the market for labor. Let us learn how it pursues these different objectives. One way to understand that is to ask, what are the sources of labor law? Labor law can be found in the rules and orders of national and local administrative authorities, the statutes passed by legislatures, national constitutions, and in international instruments. Let me explain each of these briefly. India's constitution contains a bill of rights that its constitutional courts can use to test the validity of laws and executive action. These are known as fundamental rights. The constitution also contains directive principles of state policy. These are expected to set goals for the state, but they are non-justiciable, meaning that they cannot be the basis for holding the state accountable in a court of law. In India's quasi-federal constitution, both the central government and the state governments have powers to make law on the subject of labor. This means in practice that in addition to the several statutes that apply to the whole of India, there are also statutes that apply only in specific states. A union law, however, will prevail over the state law when there is a conflict. Specific ministries or departments of the state and federal governments are charged with enforcing these laws and to pursue the labor-related policies of the government in power. To enforce these laws and policies, ministries or departments of labor may notify orders and rules. Let us now consider international instruments. Primarily applicable to countries and not to the people of those countries, public international law, often known simply as international law, establishes guidelines and a common framework to guide the behavior of states. Treaties are a principal source of international law. These are written agreements among states. In several countries, treaties become part of the domestic law as soon as they are ratified. India is not one of those countries. Usually in India, international treaties, even after they are ratified, are only an interpretative tool in cases where the domestic law on a question is ambiguous. Since 1919, the International Labour Organization has maintained and developed a system of international labour standards, which set out the basic principles for women and men to obtain decent and productive work. India, a founding member of the ILO, has been a permanent member of the ILO governing body since 1922. The ILO's international labour standards are drawn up by the representatives of governments, employers and workers and are adopted at the annual International Labour Conference. Because of this kind of tripartite participation, they represent some basic minimum standards agreed upon by all the players in the global economy. What kind of purpose do these international labour standards serve? Let us learn from an expert. International labor standards are aspirational conventions that essentially provide a normative guideline for countries 
to uh, enact laws and it, it levels the playing fields. They have their origins in the end of World War I when the social democratic yet capitalist nations wanted to stem the tide of Bolshevism with the Russian Revolution by giving us some reward to the, their labor movements. And we're talking mostly at that time about the imperial countries of Britain and France. These standards would, uh, in essence, uh, level their competition among each other as well in the world of commerce. The International Labor Organization then comes out of the Treaty of Versailles. And it was connected to first the League of Nations and then the United Nations with the reconstitution of a global international body. Now, these standards then are what's agreed upon through the International Labor Conference. And that means they are the lowest common denominator because you have to get employer organizations as well as an array of governments to agree. And, and this is I think incredibly important for women workers, that the labor representatives for most of the last hundred years have come from the peak labor bodies of each nation. So in the United States, we'd be the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the Trade Union Congress in Great Britain, for example. And that meant to the extent that these organizations were industrial organizations or maritime organizations or were dominated by male workers in those sectors, it meant that women workers weren't truly represented directly through uh, most of the labor representatives sent to the ILO to, hang, to bang out these um, negotiations on these conventions. However, the ILO from the very beginning had a, a component of its uh, constitution that said when issues involving women are going to be discussed, it encourages, encourages, it didn't mandate countries to have women delegates. It also said when colonial questions, then there should be representatives from the colonial countries. It was, it was part of an attempt to give some democratic say to the people involved, but still the reign of control would be with the hegemonic powers of that time. So that meant uh, that it was women experts and women in government that played an originary role for most of the labor standards that were developed until very recently. And with the Domestic Worker Convention of 2011, and before that, the convention that SEWA in India, the Self-Employed Women's Association, was a spearhead for home-based laborers in 1996. I believe, Convention 177. Those conventions through the process uh, allowed some input and some say of the actual workers involved through their coalition allies, really. Now, global labor standards then are important because workers can take them bring them back to their countries and use them for their own organizing campaign. So international labor standards have value to the workers of a country even when that country has not ratified it. Simply by representing the global consensus on an issue, it becomes a model for the domestic law that workers can campaign for. In India's case, even though it is a founding member of the ILO, it follows an elaborate procedure for ratifying an ILO labor standard. It does so only after national laws are brought fully into conformity with its provisions. So when you research or study the law that applies to any aspect of work in India, 
you have to look at the constitution of India, laws made by the federal government and by the state governments, administrative rules or orders brought out by a ministry or department empowered under such a law, or international treaties that have been ratified by India, including ILO conventions. In addition, work may also be regulated by collective bargaining agreements. These are agreements that employers or groups of employers enter into with groups that represent workers known as trade unions. But before we learn any more about how labor law regulates work, we must remember that labor law operates in an environment of gender inequality. In the first module of this course, we learned that patriarchal social norms push women, especially those women who bear a higher burden of care work, towards informal and non-regular work arrangements. Their marginalization makes it difficult for women workers to claim their rights and entitlements. The global economic system benefits from their vulnerability. So as we learn more about the different parts of labor law, we will continue to ask ourselves. One, does this particular law or regulation help informal or non-regular workers? And two, what barriers will women workers face in enforcing their rights under these laws? The first aspect of labor law that we will learn concerns collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is the practice of workers coming together to negotiate with employers as a group. It is a key mechanism for determining the terms and conditions of employment. Under Article 19.1c of the Constitution of India, all citizens have the fundamental right to form associations, unions or cooperative societies. Workers, therefore, have the right to form trade unions or associations which represent their demands and concerns. It is a fundamental right that can only be restricted by law on some specific grounds. In order to deal with some of these issues and to redress or improve the condition, a most important factor is that of a collective strength. Individual workers can do only very little. It's very difficult to raise a complaint. You can easily have some action taken against you. So it is important that workers get together as a collective and form unions. And it's not only a matter of bargaining for wages, etc., but even for protecting against these, what we call the day-to-day -day forms of abuse and exploitation. But while there are rights of workers to form unions, unlike in the IT sector, IT services sector, where the government uh, has put it under Essential Services Act, and therefore workers don't have employees, don't have a right to form unions. In the garment ex export sector, workers do have a right to form unions, but it is the employers and their support gangs that take action to try to stop workers from forming unions. A worker that tries to form a union or group of workers are easily removed from the factory and action taken against them. So, but now there are some unions, there are unions in all clusters. And in fact, many of the unions are now trying to form an All India Federation, which is a good thing because the more the number of workers together, the more they'll be able to bargain with these suppliers. But the important thing is that they have to bargain not just with suppliers who are their immediate employers, but actually also with the brands. And the big problem here is that unlike in say, you know, if you work in a, in, in, in a Tata car factory, or in a Mahindra car factory, you are, you are bargaining with the final owner of the car who's going to sell it. But if you work for a garment factory in Tirupur or Bangalore or anywhere, you're bargaining with the supplier who is actually selling on contracts to the buyer or the brands. And they don't come into the bargaining at all. But without bringing them, how do you change the wages that are going to be paid? Some change can be made even then, but it's very difficult to make, bring about much change. You can bring a change in wages and working conditions. Some factories have done that. And as a result, their, uh, their efficiency increased and they have been able to grow faster, but their profit rates don't really increase. The Trade Unions Act of 1926 was enacted to govern and protect trade unions. It shields members of trade unions from civil and criminal liability and also protects collective bargaining agreements from being challenged on the grounds that they restrain trade. 
It also lays out the several conditions that registered unions must comply with, including the procedure for registration, what must be included in the rules of a trade union, the minimum proportion of the members of a trade union who must be actually employed in the industry concerned, and the furnishing of annual returns. Most of the workers are women but very few of the union leaders are women. So this is also a factor that needs to be taken into account if there is to be an effective unionization of the workers in the garment sector. The, besides the union itself, there are supposed to be some mechanisms for redressal. For instance, there are supposed to be what are called internal complaints committees, ICC which by the law have to be set up in every factory in order to deal particularly with violations of uh, on, on issues of gender-based violence and harassment. But most often one is the workers don't know who are in these ICCs. Most of them are management members who try to cover up and hide what happens. And it's difficult for workers individually to be able to take up these matters as I said. So the weakness of unions makes it mean that very difficult for the ICCs to be used as really ways of redressing these, uh, uh, the, the, this violation of human rights through gender-based violence or other ways. I know of a case here in, in Gurgaon where a woman who did bring a charge and which came out in the TV against uh, somebody in her factory well, they took action against her and they dismissed her. But finally, she did manage to get reinstated. But that's because there was a union. There was a union that was able to take up her case and there were lawyers who took it up and the matter was taken to court. So there was some redressal, but it, all the redressal really depends on how strong the unions are or can be. Without strong unions, there's not much scope for really being able to redress these grievances. The Industrial Disputes Act of 1947 provides a framework for resolving disputes between workers and employers. It has provisions for negotiation and mediation, failing which voluntary arbitration or compulsory adjudication are required, ensuring the active participation of trade unions. It prohibits unfair labour practices. Refusing to bargain with employees in good faith is one such unfair labour practice. The Supreme Court of India has held that the right guaranteed in Article 191c does not guarantee trade unions the right to engage in collective bargaining or achieve the purpose for which it was formed. The trade union, for instance, has no right to be recognized by the employer. The Industrial Disputes Act also restricts strikes. Some types of labor action, for example, are classified as illegal strikes under the Industrial Disputes Act. It also prohibits advising or actively supporting or instigating illegal strikes and staging demonstrations at the residence of the employers or managerial staff members. Indian courts have denied that the freedom to strike had the same status as the freedom to associate. The latter is a fundamental right that enjoys constitutional protection. The former may be subject to legal regulation. The Industrial Disputes Act also regulates layoffs and retrenchments which are two distinct methods by which the employment relationship can be severed. These protective clauses for the workers are contained in Chapter 5A and Chapter 5B. They have limited applicability because Chapter 5B does not apply to any establishment employing less than 100 workers. And Chapter 5A does not apply to any establishment employing less than 50 workers. The Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act of 1946 which applies to industrial establishments employing at least 100 workers, requires workplaces to draft and adopt standing orders defining its employees' conditions of employment. A registered trade union may raise objections to the draft standing orders before they are certified by an officer. The Industrial Relations Code, which is set to replace the Industrial Disputes Act and the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act, makes provision for the recognition of a trade union as a sole negotiating union only if it has 51% membership. In the absence of such membership, the government may set up a negotiation council. The code also requires two weeks notice before any strike. So far, we have looked at the regulation of collective bargaining through India's constitution and a few central laws. Remember that when we think about national law, we must also look into state laws and administrative rules and orders. 
let us now learn about the international standards on the subject of collective bargaining. The right to organize and collective bargaining convention of 1949 requires states to protect workers against acts of anti-union discrimination in respect of their employment. For instance, it requires states to protect workers against acts that make the employment of a worker subject to the condition that she shall not join a union or shall relinquish trade union membership. It also protects them against acts that cause the dismissal or otherwise prejudice a worker by reason of union membership or because of participation in union activities. The Collective Bargaining Convention of 1981 requires states to protect workers' organizations against interference by employers or agents of employers, such as the promotion of workers' organizations dominated by employers or employers' organizations, or to support workers' organizations by financial or other means to bring them under the control of employers or employers' organizations. These are two of the eight fundamental conventions of the ILO. That means that, according to the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, which was adopted by the International Labour Conference in 1998, all ILO members have an obligation, by virtue of their membership in the ILO alone, to respect, promote and realize the principles in the eight fundamental conventions. India, however, has not ratified these two fundamental conventions. The Labour Relations Public Service Convention of 1978, which has also not been ratified by India, extends some of the guarantees of these fundamental conventions to those employed by public authorities. In this video, we have learned about the objectives of labor law and its sources. We also understood how labor law regulates collective bargaining between employers and workers. We must keep in mind while going through the Indian statutes that most of them apply only to specific types of work or specific types of establishments where people work. The scope of most of these laws is limited either to some types of establishments or to some types of workers. Informal or non-regular work arrangements do not ordinarily receive these protections. We must now continue to learn how labor law regulates other aspects of work, such as wages. We will do that in the next video. Thank you for watching. Thank you.